Welcome to Gutter Room. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest today is Phil McCarthy. He is the founder and the race director for the Great New York 100 Mile 100K Running Exposition. I first heard about Phil when I was doing research on the Putnam Trail. To my delight, he had actually gone on the trail and filmed running on it. New York City, areas like this, just trails and nature and trees and shrubs. Don't forget the shrubs. People talk about cutting down the trees. What about these bushes and shrubs? They hold their homes for animals. They're beautiful. They're beautiful too. But places like this in New York City are more valuable than gold. Don't let them pay that. It led to a great adventure of my own that we can cover some other time. I'm delighted to have Phil McCarthy as my guest. Thank you, Will. It's a pleasure to be here. Terrific. Yeah. Phil, let's get started by introducing yourself to our audience. For example, tell us where you were born, a little bit about growing up. Okay. I was born in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, when I was four, my family moved up to Norfolk, Nebraska, which is uh, a town of about 25,000 people up in the northeast part of the state. So I grew up there, went to school there. I have um, three older brothers, and uh, my father still lives up there as well. And it was a great place to grow up, and I grew up with a love for sports and a love for running. Of course, there's a love for football as well. It's football country, uh -huh, definitely. Uh -huh. But I was always, uh, always had a love for running from earliest memories. I remember in kindergarten running two blocks home from my friend's house after, after a play date thing. Uh -huh. so, and, and I was real proud of myself for running that two blocks home. So a shout out to uh, Corey Ben Dixon. Oh, great, <laughs> great. So you're running bug started early. Yes. Well, was it in, did it run in the family? Did your dad or uncles or cousins? Uh, my, my dad was a high school athlete. Um, he played football. You know, he grew up in a very small town. He played some football and he just did some boxing as well. Uh, all my brothers um, played football and did some sort of uh, other athletics. My uh, brother Ted, who is uh, the nearest in age, I'm the youngest of the four. Right. So Ted is the nearest one in age to me. Uh, he was a real athlete in the family. He was a great football uh, a running back, and uh, he had a couple of school records in track, 100-meter, um, 200-meter, 4-by-100-meter relay. Oh, was he an inspiration to you? Very much. And so when I was in track, I wanted to be a sprinter as well. And it was actually him who encouraged me to, he said, you can, you can get on the, the relay team, which was a big thing at that time, to get on the 4-by-100. And so I did, and we had some success. We got, you know, we got to the state meet. You know, I was always kind of like the, uh, the, the skinny little nerdy brainy kid, you know, growing up. So when I actually had some success running and track, that felt really good. Oh, excellent. And so that kind of continues to this day when I have success running. It's just that little extra bonus I was just never, never okay. expecting. Okay, but you also know for your passion for music. How did that come about? Well, that's from the earliest memories as well. Uh, my mom was the uh, musical one in the family, and and she would do we would do sing-alongs at the piano, and um, I took piano lessons. All of my brothers and I all took piano lessons from the Marion Barnett down the, around the corner, uh -huh. and um, I, I just took to it uh, especially, you know, more than my other brothers. Even I went to uh, went to college, and I decided I was going to become a music major, studying piano. Uh, classical piano, piano performance. And uh, so it's always a passion of mine, not just classical, but pop music, every, every type of music. Yeah, you know? yeah. And that's very much a strong passion of mine. I just recently gave a, uh, a classical recital back in February on Staten Island. My first piano recital since grad school in 22 years, but uh, it was fun and I had some, some good friends come by and, and, and watch it for me. So. Now, which college was that that you studied music? Uh, University of Nebraska for undergrad and University of Michigan for grad school. Both in music? Both in, in piano performance, yep. Piano performance. Yeah. Now, and I, doing and that I also studied composition, I studied voice okay. as well. So. Voice. Well, I know I've seen you with another group singing a cappella at some football game or basketball game or something. Oh, that was another, just one of those interesting uh, things that can only happen in New York. You just fall into. I met this um, this singer Carson Church through a, uh, a a project that I got involved with, and he organized this group called the Gentleman Carolers, and we would 
do a cappella Christmas caroling at office buildings, shopping malls, we even used to do airports, but wherever they were. Airports? <laughs> anywhere they would pay us to, to do Christmas kids. So oh, we'd send okay. out four guys, we'd dress up in our tuxes with the top hats, you know, and look all spiffy, and we'd do these, uh, they might be barbershop arrangements, or some of them might be more jazzy, so uh -huh, we'd uh -huh. go around and do caroling. We would send our tape around to try to get other uh, spots, and, uh, and in fact, one year, we, a number of years ago, we got on the Howard Stern Show. And, uh, in radio, I guess, right? Uh, on, on the radio, and then we did it. This is when he had a show on E! Network. Uh, so we were doing, like, dirty lyrics to the Christmas Oh, Christmas. Howard Stern okay, stuff. you had a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, but then he also sent a tape, this is just recently, to the Brooklyn Nets. And so last Christmas, or just before Christmas, we sang the national anthem for the Brooklyn Nets. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light What so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the peril of spite For the ramparts we watched were so gallant hoping to have you guys in, but you guys' schedule is so wacko. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, next time. Maybe next time. But we're here also to talk about running. I think you moved to Staten Island at some point. I moved to Staten Island in 1994. I have relatives there, um, the O'Callaghan's, my aunt Mac O'Callaghan, and a large family of cousins and cousins' kids, and a huge family there. So it was a very, uh, uh, a, a very good place to come from the small town to the big city where you mm -hmm. have... You have some relatives place. to show you the way. Well, it was to show me the way and a friendly place to come home to. Okay. And so that was very nice of the O'Callaghan's. And um, which is why I gave my recital on Staten Island. Yeah, right, right. Um, but so I lived there for a couple of years and um, eventually moved into to Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and eventually up to Washington Heights. And I've been in Washington Heights now for 11 years. But in Staten Island, that's where you did your first like formal race? Yes, in 1995. September 1995, it was the Stapleton Steeplechase, which had been held for 20 years. And this was the last year they had to run it. It was a five-mile race through some very hilly uh, areas of Staten Island, Stapleton and, and surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. And so it was a tough race, but I had a blast, and I was really hooked from that. And it didn't hurt also that from my room um, at, at the Callahan's house where I was staying, I could see the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, uh, especially looking out at night and it's all lit up. And I thought, I have to run across that bridge. <laughs> and we all know there's only one way where you can run across that bridge, and that's during the marathon. So I eventually signed up for my first New York marathon in 1997, and it just goes from there. Okay. How did you train for the first marathon? Well, I kind of read some magazine articles. I was all doing it on my own. But I, signed, I started training in February and uh, just built up mileage. My longest run, I think, up to that point had been five miles, maybe eight miles. Yeah. So I would gradually build up my long runs and just kind of using common sense and what I was reading here and there, trying to get three training runs of 20 miles or more. And... Uh, Ran the race in November. I got it 3:47. Not bad. So That's up four. That was not bad for my first. And you know, after you know, I'll, I'll do maybe a couple of marathons, and that'll be my little foray into uh -huh. long distance running. You know, I was okay. a sprinter. I'm a sprinter. Oh, okay. Uh, so I, but uh, yeah, of course, everybody says that, right? They get hooked. Yeah. And then eventually, you just thought, you know, 
I'm not going to be able to run my marathons too much faster, but I can always run farther. So that's when it snapped in me and I thought, how far can I run? <laughs> not how fast I can I run, but how far can I run? Yeah, this is before the Forrest Gump movie came out. <laughs> oh, this is, yeah, this is before Forrest Gump. Yeah. Yeah. What was your first ultra then? My first ultra was uh, the Kurt Steiner 50K in February of 2002. So this was five years later, and I'd seen it on the Roadrunners calendar. New York Roadrunners Club had, it was, um, it was uh, run in conjunction with the Metropolitan 50 Miler, which was a great race. It was held for many, many, many years. Uh, it's been sadly discontinued. But they held the, the 50K in conjunction with that. So yeah. I, and it was in Central Park. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I, somewhere in the middle of the pack, I don't remember right, the right. time. I think I finished 18th place, actually. 18th place. 18th you would still place. remember it. I, rem I remember that. Uh, OK. Yeah. Well, let's, so, let's speed up a little ahead, because yeah. now you're actually world famous because you own the record for something called the 48 hour, uh, the most miles in 48 hours. I have the American record for 48 hours, which is, um, uh, for those who are not familiar, it's a, it's a fixed time race, so you run as far as you can in 48 hours. In a loop, I believe. In a loop. This is run at three days at the fair in uh, Sussex County, New Jersey, a race which is, as we are filming this, is being held. Today? Certainly, today. Oh, one of the days. Uh. This is one of the two days. So it was three days at the fair because they have a 72-hour, 48, and a 24-hour. Okay, okay. You know, uh, so I ran the 48. Uh, this is in two, 2011. Uh-huh. And I ran 257.34 miles. <laughs> and uh, That's a lot of miles. It was a lot of miles. and But I had such a, a strong confidence going into it. Um, once I got halfway through, I, I felt more confident and stronger and stronger and even when it rained on me the last seven hours it didn't bother me i picked up the speed the last few hours i broke john geesler's record john geesler is a good friend of mine he's yeah. upstate new york uh he had the record with 248 miles and you did 258 and I did 257. i actually got an article in the, the new york daily news and that was uh and they did a whole interview too it was very yes. impressive it was it was nice so I've, I've had a little bit of press here and there but going back to that 48 hours yeah. because i read about it that was actually your third time doing it My and you time. did and but you learned from the other two yes. it was like uh, sleep and nutrition i believe yeah my first 48 hour race was it uh it was a great race Serger, uh 40 hours this is in france it's, uh, it's a track Okay, different. Oh, wow, in France. France. And that has not been held for the last few years either, unfortunately. But it was a great race, invitational only. They, they bring you to this little town and they treat you like a king. And I ran 235 miles there. And it was a really good first shot. And what was your first, what was the lesson learned from it? I don't need to sleep so much. I would, I would go down and sleep because I thought I needed to sleep, you know, for a couple right, hours, right, right. hours. Um, but I thought, well, let's see, let's see how I can do without the sleep, okay. without so much sleep. My second attempt was that uh, across the years in um, the winter of 2010 to 2011, so like New Year's Day 2011. Oh, uh, across I the years. I actually had kind of a little inflamed Achilles, which uh -huh. sidelined me. And it was, I, I had gotten hypothermic. It was very cold that year at night. Now, where, where does that help? It's in Phoenix, in Phoenix. the Phoenix area. Okay. And it's a great race, but, but. Uh, the, the weather was terrible for me, and, and my Achilles flamed up. Okay. Me, so uh, I didn't have a good race there, but then I was reminded of three days at the fair. I said, yeah, I'll sign up for that one. Okay. And, and that's when it just all clicked. Everything, and I, yeah, I learned about nutrition. Liquid nutrition helped me a lot. But, okay. then every, but then every time I try to learn a lesson, something that works from a previous race, and I try to apply it to a next race, it doesn't always work so well. Oh. Every race is so individual. Oh, okay. Is there a world record as well? The world record is held by Giannis Kouros, who if ultra oh. runners are familiar as like the, oh, he's the god. undefeated champion of ultra running. Yeah. His record is 292, 35 miles more if I wow. were to shoot for that. That's awesome. But I do have 15th best in the world. Uh -huh. Something, and I think, because there, there's a German website that has all these statistics, and I think, I'm not sure, but I think it's the best road 48-hour performance, except for Kuros. Wow. Other, other runners have done it on track. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the best. Yeah. And I do know that 
no one in the world has done better since then, in the four years since then. Yeah, yeah well, it's going to be a while, I guess, because it took a while to break that other guy's record. It was 2003, you said? 2003, yeah, yeah John yeah. Deasy's record. So they last a while. Yeah. But there's a small community, I would imagine, because you probably know all the ultramarathoners. I mean, how many people, how many ultramarathoners are there that can do 24 hours, 48 hours, 100 miles? Oh, well, I mean, it's growing in leaps and bounds. And, really? And there are... Um, there was a time when I thought I knew all the, the really good, but there are new great runners coming up all the time. So I guess you guys, you have been inspiring me to you guys then. I hope, yeah, I hope so. You know, certainly the, you know, the John Giesler's, the Roy Perung, Ray Krollwitz, they inspire me, you know, so. So you got a new crop another, coming up. The people a few years younger than me, someone, one of them's going to come, come along and break me oh, okay. Now, you've done other kind of races. I think you did the Western 100, is it called? Western States. Western States. Tell That's, us about that. That was my first 100-mile race, actually, back in 2005. Uh, and it's, it's, it's the first 100-mile like, race that there was in the country. It, was, it started out as a, uh, a horse race and became a, a running race. And it's still very hard to get into. Um, it's actually much harder to get into now than it was then. Okay. Basically, I put my name in for a lottery. And I just, by luck, I got in the first, the first year I tried. Yes. And I didn't, I wasn't really sure if I was ready for it, but I thought, well, if I, I'll put my name in for the lottery. If I get picked, I'll get myself ready. So I got myself ready, and I had a, I had a good race. I finished under 24 hours. So you got a belt buckle for I it? I got a belt buckle for that. Well, what about your crew? Did you have a special crew? I had my brother, my oldest brother, Matt, and his wife, Kim, and my dad came out to crew for me. Oh, that is very special. Yeah, and uh, I like to involve you know, my family if I can, you know. And my brother Ted crew for me at, at that race in Sergere, and he's also crewed for me at Badwater every year I've run that. How many times have you done Badwater? I've run in Badwater three times. Oh, how well have you done there? Three times, three top ten finishes. That's eighth, great. Eighth, eighth, eighth and sixth. <laughs> Thanks, and that was 2009, 2010, 2012. Oh, excellent. But they changed the course now. Now it isn't like the way it used to be. Well, they changed the course last year because they they did, weren't able to get the permit for Death Valley National Park. So they ran it on a course that was closer to Mount Whitney, which is, um, I think, a much hillier course. Oh, okay. But it doesn't have that heat from oh. Death Valley. Um, so this year, they're back in Death Valley, but they have to start it at night just because of... Whatever the, reason. The oh, so it's, it's the original course, but just a different, different starting point, Di uh, yeah. starting time. Different Great. Starting Are you going to be doing it again? Not this year. I'd like to go back and do it again. It's, it's a big undertaking, and my my travel time, my funds are limited, so I, I have to pick and choose. Obviously, yeah. it's very, it must be very expensive to do these kind of things. Sometimes, sometimes they are. Sometimes. I mean, yeah. the entry fees. It's not you know fifty bucks. What is a typical entry fee with these ultras? Well, uh, bad water is like a thousand dollars. But most ultras are. Like within like a hundred or hundred fifty dollars oh, so, or something. Like so that. bad was the exception to the thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now, you started as I mentioned at the beginning. You started your own yes. altar in New York. Yes. Called the Great New York 100, 100 K Running Exposition. Yes. What a title. Yes. <laughs> so how did that come about? Well, the race director I think has always been in my blood, being a race director, um, and I've had this idea of. Uh, 100 mile course, 100 mile race in New York. You know, every 100 mile race they're exploding in popularity. Everyone wants to do it. And there's nothing in New York City. I thought, well, how can you do it in New York City? Because if you're running through the night, you're running on New York streets at night. But then I went and I, on like Google Maps or Map My Run, and just kind of put together, pieced together some of my favorite running routes. Because I've covered this entire city on foot. I know all the places out in farthest reaches of Queens and Bronx and Brooklyn. And so I mapped together my favorite, my favorite running routes, you know, connected them with some streets, I thought, and it actually came to like pretty close to an even 100 miles. And I looked at the part where you could, where you, like the last third of the course, where a lot of people would be running at night, I thought, you know, that's a pretty safe neighborhood. That can be, you know, this can be done. And so I finally just uh, took the plunge. 2012 was the first year. I had a small number of runners. Uh, some people who I kind of trusted would 
be up for an adventure because things might not always go real smoothly. Especially the first one. The first year, but <laughs> I, so I give all the credit in the world to the, those first, I think there were 35 people who started. And I think... Uh, and 14 finishers. And I think Kayla had our suggestion. Kayla, she Kayla won. Marino was my very first winner, the very first finisher. Uh, Michael Samuels came in about four minutes later. Later. Well, I, mean, I had Kayla here, and I remember she was saying she was out running the aid station, so you had to run after yeah. her. <laughs> you need something to drink. It's, 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 I'm okay. But she had her own crew, she luckily. Had, yeah. I was trying to supply the aid stations, keeping ahead of the lead runners. One of the lessons you learn as you do as you go along doing the race. So that first year was a success in terms of 35 people, and everybody didn't get, nobody got hurt or nobody lost. Got, no, we, we had... Um, one one guy who who got a little disoriented, but we had somebody, find, you know, they found him and they kind of let him put him in a car and took him back. Oh, and okay. Him, he was okay. Okay, so it but, happens. Yeah. So what was the big lesson you learned from the first? Because obviously you did it again for the first time. Besides, first of, all, first of all, get help. Get help. And the big number one helper is Trishel Churns, who has been my volunteer coordinator, and he's been immense help with that. Elliot Lee was a big help. He was the one who's driven me around the first couple of years. The volunteers, they really outdone themselves because they, they have a lot of fun at the A stations, I think, and they take pride in, in what they're doing and they and the runners always appreciate what they do. I think you have like two or three super A stations and well, then the smaller year, ones. This year I'm going to have like every 20 miles just a little bit extra more, you know, because it started out as kind of a uh, like a fat ass run just so that, you know, somewhat self sufficient, you know, with me supplying water and Gatorade, but the runners taking care of a lot of their own food. You know, because it's, it's, a, it's a way of exploring the city and going into the stores that you pass along the way and just becoming a part of the city and a part of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's still a lot of the runners say they, that's one of the things they love is going into the you know, going into the, the bodegas or whatever. The bodegas and getting a Gatorade or or, or getting beef jerky or yeah, something, yeah, yeah. you know, whatever they need. Oh, okay. Excellent. Excellent. And I, I think um, this year, I keep reading about Bobby Long. He looks like he's one of your better aid station guys. Yes. So they give him a shout out. He's our uh, aid station um, uh, crew chief for the 80 mile in Sheepshead Bay. And he puts up a, a tent and he has. A food tent and, and like a, a burner for for soup or for wow ramen noodles. Wow. Yeah, no, he goes all out. I mean, he this goes is a all super out. station. And he's putting together some medical kits for me this year as well, and he's also teach, trying to teach me how to swim. So uh, oh, <laughs> on a side note, did, that's a <laughs> different <laughs> different thing. Oh, yeah, so he's one of our great uh, helpers. Trishel, of course, is at the 100K finish. Uh -huh. um, Joe Del Conte and Vega have been huge. Uh, oh, that's right. There's two races. You got the 100 mile and the 100K. Yes. Where does the 100K it starts at the same spot, Times Square? Yes. It, it Where does the 100K at? Times Square. The 100K finishes in uh, Forest Park, Queens. We have certificates for those who finish 100K. He and his wife, uh, Karen, kind of evaluate uh, the runners. If it's getting close to the cutoff, if they're able to you know, continue for the 100 miles or if they have to stop at 100K. Ah, so oh, that's a, that's a natural stopping point and also a natural that's gauge where you're at yeah. kind of thing. Oh, yeah. cool. Now, I now I, 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 never, I never will do an ultra marathon. <laughs> Marathon's plenty for me. But I, I noticed that in certain ones that they weigh the runners when they come in or they start. So what special precautions or, or considerations you had to take for an urban uh, ultra marathon like that, if any. An urban ultra marathon, um, we don't weigh the runners. Um, we we keep we keep an eye on them. We have like uh, even even like the first year we had uh, Lucy Maharajo. She oh, she's followed, great. She followed the the group on a bike, and she was kind of keeping an eye on people, seeing if anyone was needing any help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. But now we have the aid stations every five miles where they can go, and we make sure they carry a cell phone uh, if they need to call. Or if, and if and there are plenty of places where they can, like if they feel they need to stop, they can stop. stop. Right. And right. and of course, uh, a lot of them have pacers, so they have a buddy to do some of those. Yes, and and that's why I, I really rec oh, recommend that they have pacers at night just so they um, for safety. So keep them. First, on track, make sure they're on course, and also, you know, crossing traffic, make sure they're keeping, you know. Okay. Now, the next one is coming up, right? It's in June 20th. Is it all booked? It's booked. We have uh, 
a waiting list, and we have some people who are canceling, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be checking a few people off the waiting list very soon. So, Excellent. Yeah. It's two, 100K. How many people in 100K? Well, it's total about 85 runners. For both away. races? For both, yeah. Okay. 85. That's not bad. In your first year, which you said was 35? 35. 35. So Last year, I had about 63. So, so. it's growing. So how, what do you see as the future of this, this great exposition? Uh, that's a tough question. It, my original idea was to have it big with sponsors and media and all this. But I think after speaking with the runners, I think I like the, the low, the small, low-key atmosphere of it. Okay, but if a sponsor shows up, you, you'll, you'll talk to them. We'll talk. Okay, now how did the title, the name came about? Is there a story to that? I started out thinking just the hundred mi New York 100 mile race, and then I kind of thought, well, if it's New York, it's great. I'm thinking of like P.T. Barnum. Everything is the greatest show on earth, it's the greatest this and that. So the great New York 100 mile race, but then it, it's really not a race race. It's just a uh, fun run, and you know, you know, a lot of run races will call themselves an endurance run, or something. But that's too boring. So I thought running exposition, because this is an exposition, exposing the runners to the city and all the great places there are to run, and exposing the city to the runners, and maybe some, you know, to the sport. Right, right, right. Just bringing right. more attention. Up to 85. How many are foreigners? Do you know? I have uh, two runners from Germany. Uh, I have some. Well, some runners from uh, other countries who are living in the U.S., but uh, I have two people coming over from Germany. Germany, great. I think I have someone from Norway. I have a couple of Canadian runners. So uh, it is an international run, even though it may not be that well known. It's, it's fourth year, or fifth year now. I, I have done absolutely zero promotion, zero publicity, with the exception of this. Um, word of mouth. Just word of mouth. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fun. excellent. In closing, what are some of your personal challenges that you're looking forward to? I'm actually trying to get a collection of songs. I'm putting some, um, like I've written a few songs about running or just um, some other songs. I'm trying to put a collection together and I might do a performance of that somewhere. Or if I can get a get band together, I might do a, a recording. I've got one song out called Hopkinton. It's on iTunes, it's on Amazon. Check it out, Hopkinton. And, um, uh, but I'd like to do more of that. As far as racing, I want to get back. I want to have another good 24-hour race. I haven't had one for a while. So I might someday run across the country. Across the country. West to east. Uh, uh, across that's, America. That's, that's, that's a few years in the future. I think. Is it, I think Ulrich did it? Marshall Ulrich has done that, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you've got to he's, follow him. He's his. one of the ones who kind of encouraged me. Ah, so. all right. Well, listen, on that note, thank you so much for coming in. <laughs> thank you, Will. It's a pleasure. All right, a pleasure.